Welcome to Napa Valley Inside Out. I'm Latif Hasen, and I am delighted to be hosting this podcast, shining a light on one of the most beautiful and coveted lifestyles in the world. If you're interested in developing a property, planting a vegetable garden, making olive oil, fashion, architecture, interior design, county rules and regulations, biking paths, art, getting into the wine business, farming practices, the tax benefits of owning a vineyard, or the ultimate private tours and tastings, and all the fabulous annual cultural events we enjoy here, and so much more, then you won't want to miss this show. Every week I will be interviewing amazing talent, vintners, entrepreneurs, leaders, consultants, festival organizers, and well-known personalities in the Valley. They will share their knowledge, experience, advice, goals, passions, and their best kept secrets. Hello everybody, Pete Richmond, co-owner of Silverado Farming Company is with us today. Pete has been farming vineyards for 30 years and specializes in small premium vineyards for high-end estate wineries where the focus is on quality. So it's going to be a very educational experience for all of us. Welcome Pete. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's great to have you. Chuck McMinn and Philippe Melka recommended you and they described you as a great guy progressive farmer, and very philanthropic. My family would disagree with a couple of those, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about it. <laughs> so after getting a degree in agriculture business, you started um, managing vineyards in the Central Valley and Napa Valley. Right. And then you went on to work for Kendall Jackson, which is where you got your first exposure to farming high-end Vineyards for the light for their well for their brands Cardinal and La Coya. Correct. Right. Correct. Now I know Cardinal was a hundred point wine. Is La Coya? Um, so that was in the mid nineteen nineties, mm -hmm. and when La Coya was released, I think the Spectator scored it ninety. There was four different bottlings of it: Rutherford, Diamond Mountain, and Mount Veeder, and they were scored ninety fours to ninety sevens, um, which um, at the time was interesting because. We were doing roughly $1,500 a week out of the tasting room, and once the scores hit, we were doing $2,000 a day out of the tasting room. Doesn't seem like much today, but in those times it was pretty impressive. I, I would say it's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so you've been farming for yourself. You started your own company yeah. 15 years ago. Yeah, so we started in 2001. Um, I made the decision to go out on my own. Had always wanted to work for myself. Um, had a really good job. Had a six-year-old at home, a wife who didn't work, and another one on the way. And I decided to leave that really good job and take a bunch of equity out of my house and borrow a bunch of money and go to work for myself. And my wife was, um, for some reason, completely supportive of the idea. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, so tell us, what are some of the, vi of the wineries that you work for? <clears throat> so we typically like to specialize in working with wineries instead of growers and generally smaller wineries, although we do have a few bigger accounts. Our biggest um, winery that people probably have heard of is Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of work in Sonoma County with Paul Hobbs. Um, we have a few other small clients over here. Then Napa Valley, we work with Vineyard 29, Philippe Melka, um, Donna Estates. Um, we do quite a bit of work with Opus One, um, Round Pond, and then um, we do a lot of work with Philippe Melka on some of his consulting clients as well. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Um, let me ask you, do you do hand farming, only hand farming? Well, um, that's an interesting question and, and the definition of what hand farming is. We do have equipment that does a lot of work for us, but on high-end vineyards we find that um, you're going to touch those vines probably 12 to 14 times a year. And so um, while each vine is manipulated to get it to the quality level we want, we still use equipment. Um, versus in other parts of the country, you're going to maybe touch that line um, twice a year. So it's really about the people, and we spend a lot of time talking about people in our company and how to educate and promote the people and the workers and, and give them some understanding of what the wines are like as well. Well, I'm noticing with a lot of the planting um, these days is much closer spacing, mm -hmm. and which, which really prevents a lot of tractors, I would imagine. Yeah, we, our, our tightest spacings are, well, the work we do with Opus, um, and then we have a, a considerable number of vineyards where the vines are five feet apart. Mm -hmm. um, we can get equipment through there. We have specialized equipment. 
Um, and then obviously one of the things people forget about is more vines per acre, closer spacing, really means more cost. So it drives those costs up considerably, and we really see the yields sort of flattening out at about three tons the acre on that stuff. And it drives the costs up because it has to be hand farmed? Well, or? yeah. So you think about just capital costs when mm -hmm. you start. So you're looking at more plants, more trellising, more stakes. So you have a capital cost number that is driven up. And then you just have more plants to work on. So each, instead of being a thousand vines the acre, you might be three thousand vines the acre. So you're working that much more on that many more plants. So it just drives the per acre cost up considerably. And are you getting better quality because the vines are stressed because they're so close? I think that's um, an argument that will go on till the end of time. Oh, so, interesting. So we, I, I would say that our, our very best vineyards are the ones where we do the least amount of work. And I always say it's a typical American approach to things, right? And a typically an American male approach to things, which is we're going to beat this thing into the way we want it to be, versus the European approach is much more let it, let it be. So mm. our best vineyards, we do the least amount of handwork in. The vineyard grows, it, it essentially stops growing at the appropriate time. We water it a little bit and, and go forward. And then we have vineyards that in some cases may be planted too close together where we have to do a lot of hand manipulation on the vines because they're over vigorous. The vines are growing so much that we get those flavors and wines we don't like, like bell pepper right. um, and, and some greenness. Speaking of water, mm -hmm. uh, have you uh, been trying to move your vineyards towards dry farming? Yeah, I, I think that in general, um, a lot of the vineyards on the valley floor can be dry farmed once they're established. We like to use irrigation for the first two to three years um, to get the vineyard established, just like you would do on any landscape project. And then from there, um, we use a series of fairly sophisticated irrigation monitoring systems to decide when to irrigate the vineyard. So it's, it's really not done by... Um, just sort of sticking a shovel on the ground anymore. It's, it's done by walking the vineyard, taking measurements once a week to determine if the vines are under stress. We like some stress because that improves wine quality. And then we also have remote data sensing that is pulling information out of the soil and sending it to our office where our lab technicians are monitoring. That's fantastic because the use of water and, and how it affects the aquifer right. would be changing dramatically if more people like yourself. Yeah, and I think, I think you'll find that across the valley itself is is more, there is certainly a trend to going to lesser irrigation than there has been in the past. Um, I always like to remind people that the historical yield for Cabernet in the Valley has been at 3.3 tons the acre since the 1960s. So we actually aren't growing any more tons per acre. We've just increased our vine density. And if we are looking at it from a, we, we don't want a big yield in, in what we're trying to do because we're trying to work on the high end side of things. So keeping that scarcity, keeping those vines small, getting them to struggle a little bit is really key to what we're trying to do as far as producing really high scoring wines. So I was always under the impression that um, the hillside cab mm -hmm. was producing anywhere from say, you know, one and a half to maybe three tonnes an acre, mm -hmm. but on the valley floor, the cab mm -hmm. could produce up to six tonnes it, it, per acre. It, as we like to say, it's all site specific. So yeah. we have some vineyards where we do produce six tonnes an acre on Cabernet. Um, but we also have a number of vineyards on the valley floor. Um, they may be older plantings, 25, 30 years old, where we're down around that two and a half to three tons to the acre. Um, we have Cabernet vineyards in the hillsides where we're getting four tons to the acre. Wow. So it really depends on the site and what you're trying to do and what the winery's after. Most of what we do in our operation is we're hired by the wineries to come in and manage the vineyards take care of the vineyards because they don't have the labor pool to do it, they don't have the expertise to do it, and then we work in conjunction with the winemakers to really determine what the goal is for the project and determine what the end result is for that wine. So we're really trying to have a collaborative relationship in that process. Um, t let's talk a little bit about costing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know I've just been hearing lately from clients that their farming costs per acre have gone up exponentially. Um, so what, what, are the, what is the variation, yeah. like the range? I, I think we should stop by saying <clears throat> they've gone up exponentially and they're going to continue to go e exponentially. Yeah. And that's really driven by labor cost mm. and what, what we need to do to rec recruit labor and have labor working for us here in the valley. Um, so if you think about a vineyard of, say, that five-foot spacing vineyard that I was talking mm -hmm. about earlier, it wouldn't be uncommon for us to spend 600 hours per acre on a five-foot vineyard. Um, likewise, on an eight-foot vineyard, maybe we're spending 200 hours per acre per year. So you can see there's a huge difference oh, in that number. Yeah. Likewise, it's cheaper to farm whites than it is reds. Reds take more money to farm because we're thinning them multiple times during the season. Whites, we typically mm -hmm. only thin once. 
Um, and then it depends upon, we come back to winemaking, and we like, as growers, we like to blame everything on the winemaker. <laughs> of course. So we like to look at, like, what does the winemaker want out of the project? What, mm -hmm. what are they trying to get out of it? So, yeah, farming costs have gone up considerably. We project costs to go up roughly 6% a year over the next two years, mm -hmm. and that's because what we believe we're going to be paying our labor costs to bring labor in. If you look at Napa as a whole, we have about 6,000 farm workers in the valley. We're short at any point during the season about 1,500 people. So those people are coming from outside the area. Fairfield, Stockton, they're driving in to do the work. They're willing to do that because of what we pay. We also have minimum wage coming in to $15 an hour by 2022 in California. And you know what the cost of living is like in Napa. Mm -hmm. So we need to be considerably above what minimum wage is paying. So if they're paying $15 an hour in Stockton, we need to be paying $20 an hour here for basic vineyard work. Well, I do want to get on to that in a little, in a little bit about workforce availability mm -hmm. and housing affordability. Um, so I'll come back to that. Um, talk to us about the cost of uh, developing on the valley floor mm -hmm. opposed to up in the hillside. Yeah, it's, yeah um, we typically like to say if, if, it, if you have a permit to plant, um, if there's no rocks, relatively straightforward, we can plant a vineyard for $60,000 an acre spread over three years. And you, typically I like to tell people that's 30000 in the first year, fifteen in the next two years. So you're looking at a $60,000 number to get it into production. In um, the hillsides, it all depends on how much rock there is. We're starting mm. a new job right now up in Soda Canyon and we're going to spend $50,000 an acre just clearing the rock off of it because there's so much rock. We'll probably mm. move on. 10 acres will probably move about a thousand tons of rock per acre um, on that site. So it's really driven by the amount of rock. The other issue is water. So if mm -hmm. we have to drill a well, whether that's a one acre vineyard or a 10 acre vineyard, well costs mm -hmm. the same. Mm -hmm. um, so you're looking at $30,000 for well mm -hmm. development. And then in hillside vineyards, we have, uh, we established an erosion control ordinance in 1991 in Napa. And so any um, cultivation of the ground, disturbing the ground, we need to seed that and put straw out every winter so that we maintain those soils and we don't lose them. So our hillside vineyards could be, I said 60 for the other stuff, we can be, certainly be up around $100,000 an acre yeah. uh, to develop hillside vineyards. And I've had clients who have spent more than that. What, what is the yeah. most expensive hillside vineyard you've ever um, developed, do you think? I think we're probably pushing 100000 We actually have a project we're looking at right now that's small mm -hmm. and, and um, economy and scale are a big thing. It's four acres. It's on the east side of the valley, and I'm budgeting about $175,000 an acre because we have to clear it and the amount of rock on the site and because it's a small site, um, what it's going to cost us to do. So it, it, it will be, that will be the most expensive yeah. piece we've ever done. And one of the most expensive parts of that, I would imagine, I just know from experience, is uh, trucking the rock out, right? Yeah. Unless they use the rock on the property. Yes, exactly. So, you know, the county has really gotten away from wanting you to haul rock off. They want it left on site. Mm. So typically, and we have to dictate rock disposal areas on the site via our permit when we get an erosion control permit. So the rock has to stay in the disposal area or we're burying it. And so if you're burying it, you're typically digging a large hole um, and then maybe 20 feet deep, putting the rock in it and then overlaying it with dirt on top of it. Well, yeah, you know, that that's a lot less expensive than when they dig these caves, right? Yeah. When they dig these caves, they, I mean, because I got all my cave spoils from um, Honey, uh, Huntington, isn't it? Honeycutt. Uh, Honeycutt. Yeah. Honeycutt uh, to raise my site up three feet when yeah. I built my home. Yeah. And the trucks were just coming for days, yeah. up and down, up and down. That was the most expensive part. Yeah, we actually did a vineyard development in Soda Canyon where the owners wanted to plant a vineyard. And it's in those lava flows up in Soda yeah. Canyon. Yeah. And I said, there's no <laughs> soil here. We can't plant a vineyard. And it <laughs> overlooks the Stag Sleep area. And I said, the only thing we can do is build raised beds. And this is going to be maybe 900,000 vines. So we actually took the cave spoils. We put them on top of the rocks, built a rock wall in front of it, and planted a vineyard into that. I planted a vineyard on top of it? Yeah. yeah. And you know what? It's unbelievable. I did the same thing, but only with landscaping. Yeah. My landscaping is amazing. Everyone yeah. said, nothing's going to grow here, Latif. No. I'm like, it's amazing. It, yeah, it was actually, and, and we put um, 25 tons of compost on it to increase the organic right. matter so that we had some. But we got a vineyard out of it. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love that. Um, tell us a little bit about your company. You have how many staff? So um, there are, start at the top there, I have three partners in the company. I, I created the company in 2001, and then I've sold it to a portion of it to three key employees, um, one of which will hopefully take it over one day while I go away. Mm -hmm. And then as we get down from there, we actually uh, peak out about 350 people. Um, we have 120 full-time, and then seasonally we go up to 350. 
So that, I'm interested to know because throughout the, the seasons, mm-hmm. you don't you need a lot of people at this time and not many people at this time. Yeah. How does that work? Are they all employees? So what we do, so those hundred full time people. One of the things that I'm proudest of is we've never laid off a full time employee. Mm. My operations partner is unbelievable in scheduling work for the winter time. We do a lot of winery packaging in the winter, so we have a client that. Um, we move it 40 people into their winery operation. We package wine in November and December. We discount our rate a little bit, but it keeps all our full-time people working. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it, yeah. it really is a, yeah. a great benefit to them. And then our seasonal staff, um, we start hiring roughly about February 1st, and we hire all the way um, up until roughly May. We want to be at peak employment roughly May 1st, and they'll stay with us until the season ends roughly November 1st, once we finish harvest. And and that must be a pretty stressful experience because you don't know, because I've seen all of my clients go yeah. through this, you know, yeah. where they, they need somebody for short, they need workers for a short period right. of time, and then they can't find them. Well, we've, we've struggled with that, and yeah. we've really adopted a new program where we have a formalized plan written around hiring. We know how many bodies we're hiring a week, and our argument is we come out with what we're going to pay before everybody else does, uh. as far as our starting rate for the year, mm-hmm. and we want to set the market. So we want to pay more than everybody else does because we want the people in place, and because of the quality of properties we're working on, we need those bodies and we need high quality employees and so that's why we've sort of modified our system to say we're going to pay better than everybody else and we're going to have those people in place to get the work done in a timely manner. Right. And what do those people that you bring in part-time at certain mm-hmm. times of the year, what, what are they doing the rest of the year? Well, so um, it's interesting. We actually have, we just went through a small layoff and so right before harvest things quiet down until we get into harvest. And so we actually go through our staff and ask the folks who wants to harvest, who doesn't want to harvest. And a lot of them opt out. So we had about 40 people opt out of not wanting to harvest this year. So they self-selected out of of our employment ranks, and they'll come back to us in January. So they just choose. Harvesting's tough work. The pay is very good. We can have people earning up to $40 and $50 an hour for harvest. But generally, most of our harvesting is shifted to night work. We're starting at midnight and picking into the mornings because... It gives us capacity. We get the fruit to the winery in a cooler manner. So folks who don't want to work at night, which we, um, it gives them an opportunity to take time off. Um, and then they, if they're based in Napa, they're typically, um, they may be moving into other employment. Or if they're based outside the other, they're moving into other crops. Interesting, yeah. So you've you've figured it out because obviously there's there are so many people who at the last minute can't find anybody to harvest. Or, yeah, and we yeah. it's interesting because you're get, such a huge organization. Well, we get yeah. calls yeah. from folks who need harvesting yeah. help, yeah. Yeah. and we have to take care of our our main our our um, fully managed clients first, and then if we have time, we try to help them out. But it is a challenge for smaller folks who don't have um, staffing, and that's why vineyard management companies exist. Is because they are essentially, you can say we're a farming company, we're really a logistics company. I, I say we're, I setting, would up, say, we're yes. setting up the, uh, we don't know where we're setting up the catering event tomorrow, right. we're setting up 30 of them. <laughs> That's great. Um, it used to be that you could plant one acre, you could mm-hmm. develop a one acre vineyard on your property, um, landscaping, or you just wanted to have a small little gentleman's vineyard, and you didn't need a permit. Right. Um, is that still the case? Well, so again, we come back to 1991 and the hillside ordinance that was created. So any vineyard planted over 5% has to have an erosion control permit. Over 5% over slope. Over 5%. Yeah. And the, the landscape um, exemption existed until probably eight or nine years ago, maybe a little longer than that. It went away. So that permit does not exist anymore. So any vineyard over 5%, up to 30%, there's no vineyards developed over 30% in the valley, um, has to have a permit approved on it. And that's a fairly daunting process. It is. And uh, well, let's uh, talking about da- daunting pro- uh, process. Um, so our viewers know anyone who's who owns a property mm-hmm. and is thinking about planting a vineyard or replanting or buying a property. Can you explain the process of what you have to go through? Timber harvest conversion plan, right. erosion control plan, yeah. um, how long it takes, what the slopes need to be. Um, Etc. Yeah. Etc. So I'll start with a quick story, which is I met a fellow about four years ago who wanted to develop a property up in Franz Valley, um, and it was going to be four acres. And he was from the East Coast, and I said, "Well, it's going to take us two years, and we're going to spend sixty thousand dollars on permits to get this done." And he says, "That's ridiculous." I said, "Okay." Well, he called me last year, so it was three years later. 
<laughs> he said, I've developed 20,000 units of apartments around the United States and I've never seen anything like this before. <laughs> so it took him three years and probably sixty to seventy thousand dollars in studies and and um, permits to get approved. So we have a couple of projects in right now. So when we, if you called us and said we want to develop a vineyard, um, the first thing we do is we get a civil engineer involved, and that civil engineer will prepare the entire plan for the county. His fees are going to be on a, a minimum probably fifty thousand dollars. The next step is that we're then going to hire a biologist. The biologist is going to spend the next year looking for endangered plant species on the property. A year? A year. Mm. Yeah. And if you call me now, it's actually going to be 18 months because some plants that were blooming now don't bloom again until next year. So we always want to start that biological process in January. <sighs> we're then going to hire an archaeologist to see if there's potentially any native burial grounds on the property. Um, we're then going to send everything off to the county and the county is then going to analyze it and come back to us and say, we need more studies done. Mm. Likewise, the county is going to um, hand you a bill for their time. They're not going to account for their time. They're just going to hand you a bill for their time. Mm. Um, so it's a, I always tell people it's at least two years. It's at least $75,000. And you're not going to get everything. If you wanted to plant 10 acres, maybe you're going to get five out of it. It can be done, but it's a very involved process. And everybody needs to understand before they purchase a property, what's involved in it and don't believe the realtor who says you can plant a vineyard on here because all the easy stuff's been planted. There's only yes. hard stuff left. There's only hard, that's true. Isn't yeah. that true? And this yeah. is why we're seeing the prices go yeah. up in Napa Valley. Wow. So yeah, I always tell people at least probably three years. Yeah. And uh, so when you say that, are you talking about even vineyards that are maybe less than 15 or 20 percent? So um, if you look at slope. Um, slope, yeah, so so that's new development. Any, any vineyard that is redeveloped also needs a permit on it. That's what's called a track two permit. As long as you stay with the, exist, the existing footprint of the original vineyard, it's a, roughly a four-month process to get that vineyard reapproved to replant it. And that is going to require uh, maybe additional drainage um, to be put into the vineyard. Again, we're, all we're trying to do is keep sedimentation out of the Napa River. And so that's what motivates all this. So we want to keep the soil on the land. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's calculations that are used, and I, and I, I probably will be incorrect on this, but I've, the number that um, sticks in my head is two tons of topsoil loss per acre. We have to be less than that. That's essentially the thickness of a sheet of paper across an acre of ground. So we have to maintain the soil on the property at all times. So there was a vineyard I had clients looking at up on Mount Vida and somebody had said that, uh, you know, it has to be replanted, mm -hmm. but they felt that they had to take about a year to go through the replanting process. No. no? I mean, again, it's, um, it's a little bit like hiring the termite inspector when you, you buy your house. You hire licensed engineers that have um, contracted with the county to do this work. They write the plan and they're responsible for making sure the plan is implemented and, and um, installed per their specs. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought that a whole year for replanting yeah. was a lot. Yeah. It's, yeah, and it typically is, we like to see that vineyard, all the work get done in the first year and plant the next year. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, tell us about the Napa Valley Workers Foundation. Yeah, Napa Valley Farm Worker Education Foundation. Uh -huh. So about seven or eight years ago, my partner, Arnulfo Solorio, was on the board of directors of the Napa Valley Grape Growers. And he said, we need to be doing more to educate our employees. And so we started a small program with the, um, that turned into the Napa Valley Farm Worker Education Foundation. And it started out teaching vineyard employees um, why they were doing things in the vineyard. They all knew how to do them, but why are they doing them? And it's expand into, um, right now we run four English classes after work for employees. The interesting thing about that is, I think it serves about 100 people a year. The employers, in most cases, actually pay their employees to go take the English classes. Wow, so they're being great. paid for their time. Um, we've actually just started a new program with Upper Valley Family Center where we're also teaching um, people to read and write Spanish. And so a lot of times folks come from Mexico, they may not have the skills to read and write in Spanish. So we want them to learn that first before they learn English. Um, we just did a big program last week in Dia de la Familia at the St. John's Catholic Church. We had about 1,500 people there exposing people to the services that are available to them, but also CHP, police department, what they can and can't do. We had a partnership with Olay Health um, to do health screenings. A lot of times our folks haven't been to the doctor in quite a while, so giving them an opportunity to get health screenings. Um, and then we're trying to promote leadership within the Hispanic community. So how do we generate the next group of leaders out there that will lead the Hispanic community? So there's some leadership workshops within the Farm Worker Foundation that will do leadership. And that 
The last one we're doing is a thing called Fields of Opportunity where we are taking 20 kids who apply to the program that are in high school and these kids may or may not be on a college track and they then work for four different companies in the summer and they see how the four different companies work, what it's like to work for four different bosses. They're paid four different rates depending on what each company is paying and they get exposed to a variety of tasks in the vineyard world so they can decide if that's something they want to go into, into when they graduate. And how long do they do that for? They do, that's a two, four, six, eight week program. Yeah, and so we ha actually have a graduate from the first year that did that who stayed on with us after he graduated as a full-time employee and is now an equipment driver and moves all of our equipment around for us. And he's, Sal's probably 22, 23 years old. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, That's it's amazing. a really wonderful it's program. Fantastic. And it's, it's very generously funded by the community every year. So it's all run off of donations. Um, and so it's, a, it's very impressive what the, the Farm Worker Foundation raises each year to promote education. Now, were you the founder of that? No, no, no. Okay. no. I, I was, um, my partner was really the idea man behind yeah, that. Yeah. And um, I was supportive of the idea. So oh, I sit good. on the board, but he was the one who came up with the idea, and then the grape grower, Napa Valley Grape Growers ran with it and created their own 501c3 to manage it. So are you the only uh, farming company that is, is doing all this kind of work for no, you? No, I think, you know, the, the, the beauty of um, what we see in Napa is, I was explaining this to somebody earlier, Napa is a little bit unique in that it's very much um, a gentleman's agreement. And so if I'm farming your property, one of my competitors won't come up and ask you if he can farm it. Right. It, it's very much everybody stands on their own. Mm. And I think you will find that the vast majority of companies in the Valley treat their employees very well, above and beyond. Mm -hmm. So it's full health benefits, it's nine paid holidays, it's profit sharing, it's all the other things that go along with it to, um, we, we want to keep folks around and keep them working. Oh, absolutely, yeah. 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 So it, it's, um, it, and based on the price we get for our grapes and the price we can charge for development of land, it all works together. Oh, that's fantastic. So you uh, were the founder of uh, Silverado Farming, but then you sold part of your company. Yeah, so I, I created Silverado Farming in 2001. Yeah. I always say I did it on April Fool's Day. That's our date of incorporation. <laughs> that should tell you something. And the next day I was trying to figure out how to get rid of it. <laughs> um, you know, when you own a service business, it, it, you don't own any assets, so right. it's, it's all goodwill. And so yeah. we really felt like we had some individuals in the company who it was insurance for me. I didn't want them to leave. Right. And so why not give them a piece of the pie? Mm -hmm. And so um, I've given, I've given, I've sold a portion of the company to two key employees about 10 years ago. And our third employee, Miguel Luna, who um, went to UC Davis, spent time working in France in a couple of wineries, worked for Philippe Melka, has a small wine project of his own. I sold him a piece of the company last year. And we have a few more folks coming through the pipeline that hopefully will take the company on. My kids are not going to be involved in the company. So they'll eventually take the company on in 10 or 15 years when I go away. Wow. Um, and then you, you and your partner started the 1% um, yeah. so, community fund. So I always say I, I never have any original ideas. Usually my <laughs> ideas, some people would say stolen, they're co-opted. So but a you're book. very agreeable, it yeah, sounds like. <laughs> yeah. I read a book by a guy named Yvonne Chouinard who started Patagonia Clothing. And mm -hmm. they had a foundation called 1% for the Planet where they take 1% of their gross profits and fund um, issues that save the planet. Tearing down dams, reforestation, things like that. And I thought that was a fantastic idea. And I had recently, and this is in the early 2000s, gotten a letter from Johnny White, or I'm sorry, Davey Pena from Pena Vineyard Management oh, and Oscar Renteria yeah. from Renteria, and they were asking for money for OLA Health. And I didn't have any money at the time, but I thought, boy, wouldn't it be great to be able to do something like that. So they sort of inspired me. So every year we take 1% of our gross profits and we put them into the community foundation. We fund at-risk children and farm worker issues with that money. So it's 1% straight off the top. And people say, why 1% of the gross instead of the net? I said, well, because owners can screw with the net for a number. So we want to <laughs> make it fantastic. the gross, and it needs to be transparent. So I think to date we've been able to donate about $850,000. Oh, that's phenomenal. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it's, um, the, when I take the check, Terrence Mulligan, the CEO of the um, uh, community fund, it's one of the better days. I, it's it's oh, a lot of fun to be able to give it Very rewarding for you. Yeah, it's a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I had Rick Jones um, on the show, mm -hmm. and we were really just talking about how this community is so blessed because there are so many fabulous people yeah. like yourself and him and Chuck McMinn and the many other people that sit on many, many boards mm -hmm. to raise funds for all of these nonprofit organizations that really benefit the 
community um, and make Napa Valley a truly exceptional place to live, unbelievable health care, and to also attract some of the most incredible surgeons in the right. country right. to be here. Right, yeah. Right, with I, all the fundraising. And I, I tend to look at what we do as I'm trying to hopefully build a better community, a richer community, because yeah. my yeah. wife and I have decided we're going to stay here for the rest of our lives. Right. So, when we're old, when we need somebody to take care of us, hopefully we've done something that will transpire to help us lead a better life. And that's you know what? That's, that's, that's fantastic. And I remember when I first came here and mm -hmm. there were so many vintners um, mm -hmm. that I knew at the time, elderly vint vintners, who were making huge dona donations yeah. to the hospital because right. they wanted to have good health care right. and stay in the community right. like, you, like you do yeah. with your... Yeah. Well, you look at the work that Rick Jones has done oh. and you look at Chuck McMinn. Yes. And as I mentioned to you earlier, I love being in a room with those guys because they think at such a high level um, and are so philanthropic and generous in their their ideas. Their ideas and um, their time and their personal funds. Yeah. I mean, it's extraordinary what yeah. they do for yeah. us. No, yeah. it's, it's, we really should be blessed to be around people like that. Uh, yeah, and to live here. Yeah. Yeah. It has been fabulous to much. have you on the show. Thank you it. so much. Right. Thank you very, very much. Good. Thank you, everybody, and I look forward to seeing you next week.